So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be here. It's an honor, and in particular because I love being part of the Broad community, and the vision and sort of the values of the Broad community have been inspiring to me and, and very exciting to be part of. Uh, today I'm going to try to give about a 40-minute talk, and then I'm going to invite four patients up to the stage, and we can all ask them questions about their experience. These patients have been completely briefed about this. They're completely comfortable talking about their results. You don't need to be uncomfortable speaking to them about any question you want to ask them. One or two of them have already been on national television talking about their, uh, their experiences. So feel comfortable. They're here listening to the lecture as well. I'd like to give my support and uh, thanks to the support I've gotten over the years from NIH, Department of Defense, a SPARC grant here from Broad, and from uh, the Franco Cezani Fund. And my, these are my disclosures in terms of conflicts of interest. The Genomes to People Research Program has used, utilized a model with many, many collaborators, too many to thank entirely, but there are three in particular I'd like to, to single out, which is, of course, Heidi Rehm, whom you know well, um, Alan Beggs, and um, Amy McGuire at uh, Baylor, who have really been th threaded their talents through so many of our uh, important studies. And the Genomes to People Research Program is an implementation science program, meaning that we're most interested in that last mile problem. How do you get the kinds of discoveries that we're doing here at Broad into the hands of physicians and into the benefit of patients? So we've been looking at the medical, behavioral, and economic outcomes of genomic information. We have a fairly small, actually, core team of people, but our model is that for each grant or project that we create, we create a separate new team and form this discrete team around that project and then like a, I guess a film company, dissolve it when the, when the project is over. So this, for example, is our latest a grant that we actually brought through the Broad, which is the first study to look at return of results in long-term epidemiology studies, the Framingham Heart Study and the Jackson Heart Study, and uh, systematically uh, look at the return of results in an African-American population. Uh, which, as you know, has been a huge area of disparity. We have an annoying habit of nicknaming our, our projects. It started off kind of cool, and then it kind of, guess, it metastasized into uh, ridiculousness. But uh, nonetheless, we've kept it up. And I'm not going to talk about all these today, but um, uh, that is the way we internally refer to them. These are our primarily funded projects. And uh, we also play a secondary role, very proud to be part of the All of Us Research Program, uh, where we've designed the genetic return of results for the entire program, the Partners Biobank and Emerge, where we've designed the return of results, which I'll be telling you about, and the Verily Project Baseline, which uh, we've also designed a part of the return of results for them. So uh, it's intimidating to speak to some of the giants in this room about a period of time in which I was not even involved in genomics, but uh, that won't stop me. Uh, the narrative of prevention has been a part of the dialogue since before the human genome. And here in 2001, as the first draft was published, Francis was quoted as saying that, I predict that comprehensive genomics-based healthcare will become the norm with individualized preventive medicine and early detection. And so I'm going to talk to you today about this theme of prevention, how it's been um, actualized, how it's been distorted and uh, perhaps where it's going through uh, the last few years. Now, um, if we think about preventive genomics and we want to ask how far away is it from here, what are the obstacles, why are they there, and how we can overcome them? Because, you know, people have been saying for about 20 years now that we were just about to get to the point where everybody should be sequenced. And how much longer are we going to be saying that? Is it going to be 5 years, 10 years, 15, 20, or even longer? There are many people in my arena, uh, in my discipline of medical genetics, that absolutely say it should never happen. And so this is a real tension within the discipline of genetics and within the discipline of medicine. So as Amit referred to, we got started asking the question, is genomic information psychologically harmful? And to this day, that is often the first thing people will say. Why would you want to disclose this information? You will make people catastrophically anxious and depressed. And in part, this, I believe, is due to the first genetic test that was developed by Jim Gasella, in which 
the devastating disease of Huntington disease sort of created a template for returning information that was terribly traumatic. And so an entire infrastructure of genetic counseling, of sensitivity, of choice, grew up around this an entire discipline of genetic counseling, whereas there is no such discipline for anything else in medicine where we give bad news. We give people news that they have, are at risk for cancer, that they have cancer, that they have other devastating diseases all the time. We don't have a specific clinical discipline to tell them that information. Only in genetics did that arise. And so we did start this randomized set of trials uh, over about a 12-year period in which we put over 1,000 people through various randomized trials exploring in somewhat excruciating detail the methodology, the perception, and the impact, both medical, behavioral, and economic, of using APOE, which had some similarities to Huntington disease in the sense that it was a devastating fatal <coughs> disease, but some differences in the sense that it was probabilistic. And you could always have some relief from that probabilistic nature of the APOE. And that turned out to be a real difference. And APOE turns out to be more like most genetic information than Huntington disease. And so one of the themes that I hope I'll convince you of as we go through this is that, for the most part, genetic information, genetic risk information, is not traumatic to most people who elect to receive it. It is well received. They adapt quite well. These early results preceded the launch of the direct-to-consumer genetic testing initiatives. And therefore, I got pulled into that consciousness early. They would invite me out. I would speak to them. Francis Collins asked me to come to meetings of NIH. This is before I even trained as a geneticist. And it was partly the reason I trained as a geneticist, because I saw that this was getting so exciting. And yet, soon enough, in 2007, direct-to-consumer genetic testing <coughs> did launch. And it has profoundly influenced the path to preventive genomics. Because traditionally, and in almost every genetic center in the world, Genetics looks like this. You have affected individuals in whom you are using a molecular test to make a diagnosis. You're not thinking about predictive possibilities. You're not thinking about the future. But with direct-to-consumer, they took the what looks now by our standards the sparse GWAS catalog at that time and created the first polygenic risk scores and then presented them to you. Of course, they were roundly criticized for doing this. In fact, this was very much the basis when the FDA finally got around in 2013 to shutting down this component. And it has only reestablished itself today with one of the companies launching a polygenic risk score for type 2 diabetes. This was my risks from 2007 or 2008. Obviously, I was very interested. Uh, they were the first ones to tell me I had factor V Leiden, which gives me a seven times the risk of deep vein thrombosis deep vein thrombosis. And so I'm that guy on the airplanes in the galley doing deep knee bits. You, you, you know who that is. <laughs> but also gave me information that may or may not be useful, may or may not be accurate, as we know today, about atrial fibrillation, prostate cancer, Parkinson's disease, ulcerative colitis, and really were the first to launch expanded carrier testing, an idea that is still being resisted 15 years later by OBGYNs and the entire medical establishment. The growth of DTC genetic testing has been profound, with Ancestry being the killer app, but health apps coming closely behind. Well over 10 to 12 million people have uh, experienced this. So that is the popular experience of genetics at this point. It is the dominant popular experience of genetics. And in thinking about this, we could spend you know, many, many times. We, we actually got a grant, the first grant, to prospectively look at customers of direct-to-consumer genetic testing. There are many, many interesting things from that grant. But we looked at all the things that people were worried about. For example, they were very much worried that we would rob the medical commons. People would learn this information and go out and get a whole bunch of unnecessary medical tests. Stacy Gray led this analysis of, for example, people with elevated risk of cancer, colorectal in this case, and uh, I think it's prostate over there. Um, yeah, uh, colorectal is actually on both, both sides, um, but one of them is supposed to be prostate. And uh, yeah, PSA screening. And they really didn't. 
Interestingly, the only thing that kept popping out in some of these conditions was that people went online and purchased unregulated supplements more when their results showed them to be at elevated average risk. So people who buy genetics on the internet buy supplements on the internet. We were also able to, I think, diffuse some of the concern about pharmacogenomic testing because there was great concern on the basis of the FDA that people would change their pharmacological, um, their, they would change their own medications without consulting a medical professional. And we demonstrated that they really did not do that. And there's a lot of talk about empowerment and uh, getting people to sort of do better lifestyle, lifestyle. We did find that people reported that they improved their diet and exercise when they did the direct-to-consumer genetic testing, but this was completely uncorrelated with the risk levels they received. So it might have been a New Year's resolution. I'm going to get my DTC testing and I'm going to go to the gym. In trying to sort of integrate all this, I've come up with some positives and some negatives. I think that direct-to-consumer testing has democratized, demystified, and has aligned itself with the, the general societal trend toward expert dis disintermediation. And that's probably for the good. But I think it's done some negative things as well. It's conflated laboratories, which most of these are, with care providers. They've cleverly conflated that. They've implied that they're giving you the tools to benefit you when they're actually not your care provider, um, nor do they have the skills to be your care provider. They've created an expansive loophole where many of them today are not true direct-to-consumer, but have hired physician authorization groups to rubber stamp the test that they're giving you. And they're expanding the test more and more into the medical purview with these medical authorizations. But that is not your clinician. And neither the laboratory nor that clinician are actually your advocate. They're the laboratory's advocate. And in an interesting way, this, the limited offerings that they've made so far, plus the exaggerated marketing about the health, has sort of distorted, I think, what is the real utility of genetics, even preventive genetics. Because people have received these, it hasn't made much difference in terms of their health care. And so that's their worldview of genetics. And that's their worldview of what genetics can provide them. The number of people who think that they've been sequenced, fully sequenced, when they've actually only received uh, array-based testing from a direct-to-consumer company is enormous. So right there is a huge, huge distinction. <clears throat> Meanwhile, back in medicine, diagnostic sequencing for those children and adults with mysterious diseases was, was going gangbusters. But when you can sequence the whole genome and you're looking for a cardiac um, variant, what are you going to do about the others that are in there, the so-called incidental findings? And, as, and, the, and, and this raises the question, what's the correct model for genomics? Is it like the rest of medicine, where if you do a chest x-ray for one cause, you're obligated to report the incidental finding that you might see another cause? You'd be, you'd be sued for malpractice if you didn't do that. Or is the model really one where We've rejected the idea of putting the whole population through a whole body scan, because we know we would find lots and lots of little things we'd have to chase down. Some of them would put you on the operating table. Some of you wouldn't do well with anesthesia. Some of you might even die. So for the moment, we've rejected the notion that we should take everyone in this room and screen them with imaging for that reason. So which is genomics closer to, this model or this model? There's a lot of information in a chest x-ray. But the difference is that radiologists have come to an understanding about which pieces of information they should pay attention to, report, and act upon. And imagers have not yet, fully. Most of the, radi radi of the chest x-rays in the world, we know this to be true. So I was fortunate to lead a working group for the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics in which we tried to make clinical recommendations for incidental or secondary findings. As most of you know, we came up with about 24 conditions and 56 genes, which was later modified to 59 genes. And this became the so-called actionable set of genes. Now, of course, this is a gross um, misnomer. We know that lots and lots of other genes are actionable. We know that many of these, particularly in the cardiac sphere, have been revised since then. And it's really a tragedy that the ACMG 
committee, which I'm no longer on, has not updated this list much more uh, aggressively than they have. But nonetheless, it's, it's been a benchmark in the sense that the so-called ACMG59, these 59 monogenic genes, have been at least a set of genes that people could call on and say, OK, here's a set that somebody endorsed. Now, in the meantime, large-scale genomics for research, which so many of you have been leaders in, was taking place all over the world, starting perhaps back in 2005 and with the UK Biobank. And, uh, and in, in this country, one of the earliest was the Vanderbilt BioView. Bio These guys made a dis specific decision not to return results to anybody who was in there. It wasn't really on their radar at that moment in time. But the first to do that was really Geisinger who got started in 2014 with a large influx of money from Regeneron and have consented now 250,000 of their patients. They've provided 177,000 samples. They've sequenced uh, 64,000 and um, analyzed them for clinical relevance. And they've actually reported back clinical results on close to 1,500. So this is sort of the largest experience in terms of returning this information. Meanwhile, large-scale genomics research all over the world has been moving forward. And some of them are returning results. For example, in <coughs> Genomics England, um, there is a limited return of mostly cancer-related results. Some of them are thinking about it. Some of them are talking about it. But on the whole, return of genomic results in large-scale genomic studies has been certainly a United States trend. And this is my. Um, this is sort of my idea of why this is. So there's been a kind of, in the ethical sphere, there's been a respect for participants who want information about themselves, whether it's genomic or any other kind of research. The idea that if you give of yourself to be part of a research study, you should get back any piece of information you want, whether it's clinically relevant or not. But that's your right as a research participant. Then, of course, there was this influence and, and the lack of ultimate harm that's been demonstrated by the DTC genomics companies. Then there was sort of the ethical expectations as we became to realize that some of these findings were really, truly medically actionable. This was sort of given a boost by the Angelina Jolie effect in 2013. There was a well-documented boost in testing and follow-up after that announcement. And then um, there was a sort of rapid acceptance of the opportunistic screening that we created the opening for with the ACMG59 in clinical sequencing. And so people argued, well, if you're going to test someone for a heart problem and you're going to look for a BRCA mutation and you're going to report it in them, isn't that a form of population screening? Um, and the answer is yes. We, we kind of defined it slightly differently. We defined it as opportunistic screening, because that person was already being sequenced within the, you know, the, within the arms of the medical system, presumably with some gen genomic expertise. It was really different than a sort of public health approach to population screening. But it certainly raises the question, if you think it's valuable here, why isn't it valuable there? If you think we should be, and now, by the way, most IRBs are requiring us to return opportunistic screening in our biobanks, why are we not advocating for population screening in our general population? Well, we have a population screening genetics program in the United States and most of the Western world. It's called newborn screening. It actually looks for metabolic uh, variants rather than genomics in most cases. Uh, but it has profoundly influenced medical culture in that these Wilson and Youngner criteria, way back in 1968, said only tell people what they absolutely need to know to avoid an imminent medical problem in the first few weeks or months of life. That's your standard. That's all you're going to do. And that's because we're going to enforce this. We're going to require it for every citizen. And that's a very different idea than the kind of screening where somebody can opt in or out. This is a true public health obligation, whereas other types of screening, like colonoscopy and blood pressure measurement and mammography, are actually quite optional. So there's a, it's important in discussing this to distinguish between an obligate public health program and an optional 
but potentially medically beneficial screening program that you have the freedom to opt out of. And so this population screening with genomics debate has genuinely intensified over the last couple of years and boils down to three arguments on one side and three arguments on the other. On the pro side, um, you actually can find medical conditions that were not previously explained or were misdiagnosed by screening people who didn't even know they already had a genetic disease. And one of the patients we're going to present to you uh, fulfills that. You can risk stratify for people who either already have the disease and don't know it or who are going to get the disease in the near future. And you can enhance surveillance and prevention. And many people simply wish to know. They wish to know whether it's early onset or late onset, mild or severe, childhood, adult, painful or painless, and actionable or actionable less. About 15% people want to know less if it's, actionable, if it's not actionable, but the majority of people, at least on surveys, say they want to know. Against this is the issue that rare conditions with low prior probability will be more likely to be identified in people who will not eventually develop the disease. It's not exactly a false positive, because <clears throat> they, if they live long enough, they might get the disease. Or if the disease was fully penetrant, they might get the disease. The variant is correctly, uh, correctly analyzed. But because of censoring and because of variable penetrance, they may not develop the disease. And in rare conditions, you're quite likely to identify lots and lots of these. No one has really proven the clinical utility of finding these early. There's, there's some common sense clinical utility, and I think you'll hear some of that from our patients. But it's very hard to say, we're going to do genomic sequencing early in your life, and we're going to track whether you develop cancer 15 years from now, or heart disease, or your cardiomyopathy. We can uh, treat it, and over one year, two years, or three years of an NIH grant, uh, we're going to be able to see a clear differential. And it's really true that there's completely inadequate expertise in the entire medical workforce uh, in the United States and around the world. Because genomics is, at this level, a bit complicated. And uh, it's not comfortable. And it's not reimbursed. And those combinations make it uh, radioactive for most primary care doctors. <clears throat> so how do we study the value of population sequencing? Well, Geisinger, who's done the most in this area, has reported some beautiful papers. I'm not going to review their work, but the trouble with theirs, their work is that it's oops, the trouble with their work is that there are no control groups. It's very interesting because IRBs at this point have gone from skepticism to enthusiasm, spending no time in between at equipoise. And so at Geisinger, they believed from the get-go that this was a requirement, an ethical requirement, and they did not feel they could do a control group. And so what they've been able to report is on the percentages of people, and they've done some beautiful work on lipidology, and they have a paper that I reviewed coming out looking at um, some of the interesting downstream utilization of medicine. But what they haven't been able to answer is whether it was different than if the people had not learned this genomic information. So with the background that uh, I had in randomized clinical trials, it was natural to try to consider a randomized clinical trial of whole genome sequencing. This was a lot easier said than done. Um, we designed the trial with some patients with cardiomyopathy that Cricket helped us with. And there's a whole element of, of panel versus sequencing testing that I'm not going to talk about today, which is quite interesting. But within that, we had an arm that were ostensibly healthy individuals. And this was the first time ostensibly healthy individuals had ever been sequenced comprehensively with over 5,000 disease-associated genes examined, way more than the ACMG-59, of course, and in a randomized control group. Now, the biggest finding was that the people who signed up for this and didn't get sequenced were pissed. Uh, these were people who actually wanted to get sequenced. And we designed a one-page 
form that primary care doctors were trained up in a six hour training session to use. And we tested them on whether they could use it. And we presented lots and lots of results from this, including an actual early polygenic risk report in which we did polygenic risk for sort of cardiometabolic features. Sort of primitive at that time. We have a, a paper describing how we did it. Um, I wouldn't hold it up to the work that's being done now, but still, it gave directional, I think, interest to the primary care doctors. And they, they found this fascinating because these were the diseases that they were comfortable with. So we found a lot. If you look for a lot of genes, you find a lot of findings. And you could say, oh my gosh, that's terrible, but I think it's great. We found a number of monogenic, pathogenic and likely pathogenic mutations in all of these conditions in 100 healthy people. And when we circled back to those people who had these mutations and we looked more closely at them, what you might call deep phenotyping, we found that about a quarter of them already had clinical or biochemical evidence of the disease that had been unrecognized before. So that's 20% of you, 20% in this room of people who are walking around with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation in a disease-associated gene. And, and the primary, yeah, no, I'm sorry, I gotta keep running it, and if there's time, I'll, 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 we'll talk at the end because I wanna make sure we hold time for the patients. Um, we also did not use a genetic counselor. I, mean, I know it's heresy, but we got this information right to the primary care doctors. And then we ta audio taped all their interactions, had a panel of experts evaluate them to see if they were making any egregious errors. Fortunately, their recommendations were judged as appropriate in most cases. In the cases where they were not, they did too much. They didn't do too little. <clears throat> we also estimated the kind of verbal errors they made with transcripts of their conversations to patients. And Joel painstakingly uh, analyzed these transcripts to discover that there were no high-risk errors made, a number of low-risk errors and a few medium-risk errors made in their conversations with the patients, which we could then circle back and reinforce their education with. And there were tests that were ordered as a result of the combination of monogenic disease risks and polygenic disease risks. Uh, but the costs of ordering these additional tests were not tremendously high. And so we were, again, demonstrating that cost was not exaggerated by, and here's, here's the control side, here's the sequencing side, and here are the individuals who were found to have monogenic risk variants. This person was actually hospitalized for an orthopedic injury, but that's the way a randomized trial works. Um, and uh, so we counted the costs. And so the costs were not, as you can see, meaningfully different for those, but the directionality of the workup was different and did discover these things that I've mentioned. And like the APOE styles uh, work that we did, there was no increase in anxiety, depression, test-related distress, or any other psychological measure that we could measure with our validated scales. Nor among the people who got whole genome sequencing was there a difference between those who learned that they had whole genome sequencing results and had no monogenic findings versus those who learned that they were carrying a monogenic finding. We also, under Heidi's leadership, reanalyzed these data two years later and found that 22% of the cases had changed the variant classification over that time. Most of them not dramatically, but this is a compelling argument for a topic that continually is discussed with very little data. How much and how often should we be reanalyzing genomes? Well, if it's good to sequence adults, wouldn't it be better to sequence people earlier, even when they're newborn babies? We've been talking about this for a long time as well, and Francis, again, has been quoted as saying, it's coming. So with the help of Alan Beggs and Ingrid Holm, co-leadership of Alan Beggs, and with, with important uh, leadership by Ingrid Holm, we designed and implemented the BabySeq project. Again, a controlled trial of whole exome sequencing, again with comprehensive interpretation, this time though with only about 1,500 genes because we restricted these to pediatric and adolescent onset. Again, the most exciting part of this, I think, and certainly the most groundbreaking part, 
was performing this in healthy newborns, where there's a lot of controversy over whether this will damage the relationship between newborns and uh, their parents. Once again, with a smaller set of uh, genes to, um, to interrogate, we found a high, a surprisingly high percentage of monogenic findings. Again, we found a variety of things. And again, when we circled back and deep phenotype these babies in light of the DNA finding, we found phenotypic evidence that the baby already had a component of the disease. Now, this is a true glass, half empty glass, half full thing. You could say, yes, but would it have made a difference in their clinical outcome? Or you could say, thank goodness we found that so we can surveil those babies, keep track of these pathology, and be on top of it as their life progresses. We also found, as we did in MedSeq, a lot of people whose family history turned out to be inadequate, even when collected by a genetic counselor at the beginning of the process. But in light of the DNA finding and going back and saying, are you sure there's nobody in your family with cancer? Or are you sure there's nobody in your family with fainting? Um, we've, we picked up important elements of the family history. So it's DNA as a kind of entryway to the entire medical profile. Once again, and very importantly in this case, anxiety, depression in the parents, parent, validated parent-child bonding scales, validated child vulnerability scales were all completely no different from the control group to the uh, sequenced group. And you're going to hear from one of the mothers today of one of the children in this study. With the help of and leadership of Kurt Christensen, we've been examining the cost structure of people after they learn that they've been sequenced. And again, it's dramatically undramatic. There really isn't a dramatic increase in costs, at least in the short term. Most of, these, most of our analyses have been three months, six months, one year so far. And Kurt is uh, leading modeling approaches to try to take what we've learned from the frequency of mutations take what we've learned from the beginning data that we've had in the first year, and then model it out over a lifetime to try to ask, how much is it going to cost to actually prevent death, to save life in these children? And currently, uh, these projections for just one condition are 230,000 per life year, which is, by most conventions, a little too much. But you can easily see that as costs come down, for sequencing, analysis, uh, that this will drop to the, about the $100,000 per life year saved. And that is close to the seventy dollars to $100,000 threshold that we use in public health to justify a treatment or an intervention. So I think we're truly approaching the day where we can try to demonstrate that some of this is what you might consider cost effective. So looking across MedSeq in adults, BabySeq in newborns, and MilSeq, the first sequencing study in the active duty military in the Air Force, we can see that there is a high percentage of monogenic, pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants in these individuals, all of whom presented as healthy. We uh, actually looked at a series of monogenic weak effect uh, genes in the MilSeq, like APOE, LARC2 for Parkinson's disease, and a high percentage of people had at least one of those. In MedSeq, a high percentage of people were on the upper end of the polygenic risk score for cardiovascular. Across the board, people had expanded carrier testing with a high uh, number of um, positives. And uh, where we looked extensively, a high percentage of people had an atypical response to at least one drug category. So that's a lot of information. Meanwhile, here at Partners Healthcare, in the Partners Biobank, which is being led by Scott Weiss and um, Beth Carlson and Jordan Smoller, we were tasked with developing a return of results protocol. And uh, led by Carrie Blout, we had people who were chipped and people who were sequenced. And so with the uh, uh, leadership also of Matt Lebo in the laboratory, we went back to the ACMG 59 and did a series of steps, sending them letters, sending them phone calls, giving them multiple places where they could opt out, resampling them since none of this was CLIA, then sending them to our, a specialist of their choosing or our choosing, 
and, and entering their results into the EHR. This is a pretty interesting process in that we've now done this for 30, close to 36,000 participants who were chipped and 2,500 people who were sequenced. Between these, we saw 2.7% in the sequence group uh, positive for one of the ACMG uh, genes and almost 0.8% uh, in the chipped group. And of the 181 people that we reached by phone, uh, we see that 20% said, no, thank you. I don't want to know which I think is great because it, it demonstrates that people are able to generate agency about whether they want this information or not. We've had a hard time and are very worried about the people who are passively opting out. Of course, a number are deceased, but a, quite a number already had, this in their, um, uh, already had this in their EHR, but 75% did not. And when we called them, Cricket asked me the other day, is it because they had a secret file with this information? Uh, and they just weren't telling you, well, everyone that we reached by phone did not know. Uh, they uh, did not, it wasn't that it was just not in their EHR, they truly did not know it. So 75%, as best we can tell, had no idea they were carrying these, any one of these 59 mutations. They were mostly cancer and cardiovascular, uh, and the percentages of each were pretty similar, whether you got it off of the chip or whether you got it off of the sequencing. We've recently been looking at whether these people met NCCN criteria, for example, for the 15 cancer genes or not. First of all, again, among the cancer genes, just the cancer genes, only 45% had this already in their EHR and 55% did not. And it turned out that half of them met NCCN criteria when you just reviewed their chart. If you never saw the person, if you never looked at their DNA, you just looked at their chart, Half the people met NCCN criteria for genetic testing for cancer. And if you looked at those, about half of them um, met it on the basis of family history. But it's a lot of work, and it's not funded. And as people get enthusiastic about sequencing more and more biobanks, they're not actually partitioning funds for any of this return of results. We were able to support this through the Emerge project, through the ge generosity of, of Scott and, and the belief that this, this was imp important. But look at the number of letters that we sent just for this 152 people and the number of phone calls we sent. This was hours and hours and hours of really grueling and sometimes very unsatisfying work. There were people that we had 40 interactions with. I'll call you back. I want to do it, but I don't have time now. And we kept chasing them down. Nonetheless, this is the procedure that, with a few modifications that we've developed for the purported million people that are going to be enrolled in the Precision Medicine Initiative, all of us research. And we've helped design this return of results workflow. It's very similar to what we've done in the Partners Biobank uh, with uh, both the positives and the negatives. Now, approaches to public population health with genomics, therefore, are springing up all over the country. Most of these are being started by places that are not particularly academic. They're not particularly focused on research. They're doing it as market differentiation. And they're hiring direct-to-consumer laboratories to provide the testing for this because they're doing it cheaply. Very interesting, with the exception of Geisinger, who's done it a completely different way, but even they have now made it a clinical service. So this is a really interesting phenomenon. You can see that the sequencing is with the uh, orange color and the genotyping is with the blue color. And with really not a very sophisticated sense of the limitations of either, whether you're talking about what's missing in, in array-based testing or whether or not they're including structural variation in sequencing, it's really a rush to say, hey, everybody, look at our healthcare center. We're doing population genomics. So that's an interesting development. When I've been asked to comment on this or advise these, what I've been trying to do is push them into this corner of this three-dimensional graph. There are now, thanks in part to the enormous efforts of ClinGen, uh, which Heidi, of course, helps lead, there are, of course, now, some types of semi-quantitative standard for gene disease validity, whether it's definitive, strong, or limited, 
for variant pathogenicity and for clinical actionability. So if you try to find the sweet spot between those scales, you can define in definitive and strong gene, disease gene validity, in pathogenic and likely pathogenic, and not with VUSs. And in those conditions, starting with the ACMG59, that are unabashedly clinically actionable, you can define a sweet spot. And so I think if we take these healthcare systems and we sort of nudge them to move into that sweet spot, we are probably minimizing the harm and po possibly maximizing some benefit that is going on there. But if we really want to capitalize on the benefits of genome sequencing, we have to be comprehensive, and I believe we have to do it in a medical context. So at Brigham, we've started the Brigham Preventive Genomics Clinic. We have a number of clinicians, medical geneticists, primary care doctors, and genetic counselors. We created a menu for the patients so they can decide whether they want to pay out of pocket for whole genome sequencing or a panel. We spend a good two hours with them. Uh, their insurance pays for the visit but does not pay for the testing. Um, and uh, we've struggled with the uh, potential elitism of that, but we are collecting the information and we are using it secondarily for research, but we're offering it as a true uh, medically contextualized, menu-driven, preventive medical experience. We examine the patients. And some of what we found in the first 90 people who've called us is remarkable. First of all, some of them are still being scheduled, but um, several of them, after we told them what we did, they declined after a quick phone screen. Some of them had heard of us from outside Boston and didn't want to travel to Boston. Six of them, or this slice of the pie, just on the phone call, we said, this is the wrong test for you. You shouldn't be getting this test. You should be getting an indication-based genetic test. And here's, here's how you can do that. Go to genetics clinic, go to cardiology clinic, go to oncology, whatever. Of the people who did come and see us, seven elected for limited screening panels because they were only interested in certain things. Twelve of them, once again, once we either found physical findings or family history or complaints, we said, this is not the right test for you. You should get an indication-based test. And then on the, on the others, curious and interested in true screening, they got whole genome screening. So I would argue that this, this is, an, is a counter-argument to the notion that we can help everybody with population-based sequencing. Until or if population-based sequencing and its analysis gets just as comprehensive as what we can do in this clinic. And that's a possibility, but I believe it's a, still a ways off. So are we almost there? Is it time? Will you leave this room? and go out and get yourself sequenced in a, in a medical context, join a research program in some way? Um, well, I'll, I'll leave you with these numbers. In monogenic disease, we're finding that conservatively, 15% of people are carrying a dominant mutation, 80% are carrying a recessive mutation. If you're planning to have children, I would argue that this is important to you. Uh, low, low probability, but important for you to know. And you will not get this kind of comprehensive, expanded carrier testing from your OBGYN today. Everybody's excited about pharmacogenomics. We don't really have to push that. That's familiar to the medical model. And we've even looked at the literature, including much of the literature that's come out of uh, Mass General. And this is, correct me afterwards, please. This is, this is my estimate of the number of people who are greater than 2.5 times the risk of the rest of the population in each of these common conditions. Now, if that's even close to accurate, then what we have is in the general population, or at least the general population of whose ethnicity this has explored, we have about half of males and a little less than half of females who are carrying at least one polygenic risk score that is at least two and a half times riskier than the rest of the population. And if that's true, of course, many of these already have the condition, so they wouldn't, it wouldn't be news to them. But a substantial number of these would be at risk and can be intervened. And of, and of course, our um, uh, former, formerly a fellow with our group, Jason Vassy, 
has just gotten an innovator award from NIH in order to do a randomized trial of this, uh, which we're very excited about. We've also done the first randomized trial of using cardiovascular polygenic risk at Mayo Clinic, and we demonstrated that, I think for the first time, that a biological measure, a proxy measure for future health, in this case lipid levels, were improved when the patients and the clinicians together receive the polygenic health risk in the high-risk individuals. So I want to finish up by reminding you of these numbers. And thank you for your attention so far. Um, I think we've we finished exactly on time. So as the patients are coming up uh, to the front, um, let me open it up for questions, starting with you, Matt. to the, not the sensitivity, but the specificity of the findings. Because 20% in your adult uh, sequencing seems high to me. Might not be, obviously. But at least two of the mutations there would not be expected to be found in healthy people walking around. One, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia congenita. That's a very recognizable condition. So there might have been a type 2 collagen variant found in that individual. Did that individual really have SCDC? Yeah, the question is, is a very specific one about that mutation. And, and I, I don't know. I'll have to go back, I'll have to go back and ask. But the general one about specificity is absolutely right on. Um, and I think that's, that's a question that we hope to answer. I mean, one of the things I've, I've talked to Daniel about is to what extent can we go back and find some of the individuals in NOMAD, and, um, and, and it's, it's very complicated there. But in Framingham and Jackson, where we have living patients being followed, we now have access to 7,000 top med genomes. We now have gone through two years of work to do, get an ancillary study approval from them. And in addition to returning the results, we intend to try to go back to people and find out, is, it, is there any sign of the disease? Is there a biochemical signature of the disease? Was it missed, or is there absolutely nothing, especially as they grow older? Because that's, that's the question, absolutely. Yes. Really nice talk. I just had a quick question on how insurance is paying for this. You know, I mean, as you know, I'm a preventive cardiologist, and so people come to me asymptomatic, and I can bill for abnormal risk factors, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension. But there is no billing code for you know, an abnormal genetic finding as the reason. So right. how are you thinking about this? So the question is about a billing for um, Preventive Genomics Clinic. We are currently billing under um, genetic counseling uh, and uh, no diagnosis. And uh, as best we can tell, because that's such a trickle in the giant ocean of billing, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> Uh, it has either been approved or has slipped under the radar, and uh, so we're we're absolutely honest. But uh, so far, it has been paid for. Yeah. So, with a lot of these patients um, who might be enthusiasts for genetic testing um, and for learning their monogenic and polygenic risks, what have your discussions been like about those with? perhaps decreased risk compared to the general population, probably with a subset that's willing to do more. Yeah. And um, have you had conversations about kind of decreased screening and how it goes going? The question is about decreased risk and decreased screening. There's a fascinating angle to this because you could imagine that genetic testing could give people a false sense of security, what I'd called in the old days the jelly donut effect. Oh, I'm at low risk for type 2 diabetes. Pass me the jelly donuts. And, and uh, we've, we've demonstrated in a smoking cessation study uh, where we tested that, were people less likely to quit smoking when they found they had a genetic profile that was less likely to create cancer in the face of smoking. And we did not see that false reassurance effect. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen elsewhere, but that was a particularly salient one. So um, false reassurance is a concern, and uh, we haven't s seen true evidence of it. But the other part of your question, I think, is whether there might be a legitimate reason to save medical costs by l surveilling less or being less aggressive 
about medical surveillance in people who were very low. That's a little bit of a scary topic, but it's certainly one that health insurance companies are quite interested in, for sure. Let me, let me, let me uh, make sure we have time for our, our patients. And uh, we may have one other patient joining in a few minutes, um, but uh, let me let them each introduce themselves for about five minutes. And as they do, I'm going to show you a slide of the condition that they were found to be at risk for uh, on, the, on the slide. So uh, Ruth, why don't you go first? And you, you actually have a connection to the Human Genome Project, right? Um, yeah, actually. I, so my name is Ruth Chabriz. Yeah. I'm 56 years old. Sorry. Is this on? Yeah. My name is uh, Ruth Chabriz. I'm uh, 56 years old. I um, live in Ipswich, Mass, but am native to Stuttgart, Germany. Um, I am professionally a scientist and have worked in life science for 34 years, but this is not why I'm here. I'm here as a patient. Um, I carry a BRCA1 mutation, which was identified through the biobank. And I'm, you can call me, one of those genomic geeks um, that just really is very curious. Uh, not only, a lot of it came, you know, be, yeah, came through my work. Um, I wanted to know more about myself. So um, in 2012, um, I was diagnosed with hypertension um, and also with an ovarian cyst that kept growing back. Um, I had one when I had my first child, which was removed um, laparoscopically in 1994. And then it came back um, in 2012, coupled with hypertension. So I went on meds, and I had uh, my left ovary removed and the cyst and stabilized medically. Everything was great. The pathology that took place back then in 1994 and 2012 came back as BRCA1 negative, which was interesting. It was done here in the, in the local um, Leahy uh, clinic system, but things have changed a lot, as you just heard from Dr. Green. So anyway, um, I enrolled myself in the biobank in 2015, um, and a lot of it started through when the electronic health records went digital. I actually discovered the biobank through the Partners Gateway, and and uh, so signed myself up uh, for with the cardiology group because of my hypertension. And they then suggested, why don't you go to the General Research Bank as well, which I did. So I did. And you, I probably may never get any results back, who knows? But if they find something, I hope they would contact me. I also enrolled in the All of Us program and had myself tested um, for, with 23andMe. The interesting part on 23andMe is that based upon the populations they choose, I'm a complete wild type, okay? And it was just not worried. I learned a lot about my ancestry, but until last year in July, I got a call from a genetic counselor at MGH. And they asked me, you know, you carry a mutation. Would you like to learn more about it? I said, sure, why not? So uh, it was shared with me, um, and, uh, and, and the next step was to then get a repeat test, which was a saliva test which confirmed the mutation. I thereafter had um, in-person meetings at MGH with counselors, and I was referred to um, genetic cancer surgeons. As BRCA1, right, puts you at high risk for um, breast and ovarian. Since I've had a history on the ovarian um, stuff, I said, let's just get rid of it all. <laughs> And in October last year, I had a complete hysterectomy. And I have to say, it was here at MGH in Boston, and it was a piece of cake compared to three other laparoscopies that I had done. I recovered super fast, and I'm feeling great. So now I'm approaching the breast cancer screening. Um, the recommended guidelines are twice a year. And, um, Still debating where I'm going to do it, if I'm going to go into the partners or the Leahy system, not sure yet. But I want to say from the insurance side that um, everything was covered. Everything, no question asked. And even to the point I shared these findings, the pathology of the hysterectomy was benign, which was good news. Um, I did share all of that with uh, five siblings in Germany 
and I have two daughters. My daughters are 21 and 25. The 25-year-old had herself tested. She lives in LA, and she's not BRCA1 mutation positive. So she was really thrilled about it because it changes everything for her about her family planning moving forward. I am my 21-year-old, she's not sure yet what she's going to do with it, but she actually came to the um, appointment with a genetic counselor and is, they're both very involved. Mm. My um, siblings in Germany, I think they're sort of, they don't know what they're going to do. Who knows? Um, it's different um, in different countries, especially on the privacy side, but I wanted them to know. And my stance is I'd rather know and do something about it than not know. Perfect. Okay? So we're so going to... Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Yeah. We're going to ask uh, Brian to tell his story, yeah. too, for about five minutes. Thanks. Hey. Hi. Yeah. Just on. Okay. Hey, we'll switch. Oh, wow. Look at that. All right. Hey, um, so uh, uh, thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Dr. Green. So uh, this is not karaoke. I saw the microphones. I, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, my story is kind of long convoluted. I'll try not to throw out too many red herrings. So 16 years ago, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Not important to what I'm talking about today, but because I got uh, multiple sclerosis and was uh, coming here to Mass General, my doctor eventually told me about the biobank and said, hey, you want to get sequenced and stuff? And so I said, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. Um, was not connected with the multiple sclerosis, but it was how I got introduced to the biobank. So uh, then as part of treatment for MS, I was switching medications and I took this uh, drug that was going to clear out the abagio so I could start in the acrelizumab and uh, the, that medication that cleared things out caused problems. I had this uh, issue with my whole GI tract and my appendix and I had to go in and so I went in and got checked and anyway, uh, that all got fixed but they said, you know, you should come in and get a colonoscopy afterwards. So I, I did. But at the same time, I got a call from the biobank, and they said, hey, Brian, we found something out that you might want to know about. So uh, I talked to them, and I found that they had this attenuated FAP genetic mutation, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce what FAP actually the acronym means. It's just okay, it's it's beyond me. And, and look, it's right there. So you guys, you guys know all this. I don't have to tell you. Um, and so I got the colonoscopy, and I had six large polyps, and uh, and they said, okay, they're not cancerous. And uh, I was 54, I think, at that point. Yeah, 50. Yeah, you, Brian, you knew that the general um, recommendation was to start having colonoscopies at age 50. I did. You knew that. And had you done yes. that? No, I had not because... <laughs> Just saying. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm still sure that I'm invulnerable and will live forever. But turns out that's probably not the case. So uh, I did, and I did not get the, at 50, didn't get the colonoscopy. This was a surprise to me. I had six polyps. I'm like, what? That's crazy. And so uh, we did that, and then I went in, and I talked to the genetic counselor, Jeanette, and she said, you have this attenuated FAP, which, by the way, really made me happy that it was the attenuated version of FAP. I'm just saying, it's whew, the other one, it really bad. Um, but it said, it increases your risk of colon cancer. Um, and I said, okay. And then we talked about it, and I went and saw Dr. Chung, and uh, he said, you know what, though? This is what we do. We do colonoscopies regularly, remove any polyps, and, you know, you'll be good. I mean, you know, none of us are going to live forever, but, uh, you know, get rid of some polyps and, and, you know, can stay ahead of it. So, um, yeah, I went and, and got that. And I've had since the first colonoscopy, about six months later, I had another one. And sure enough, there were three small polyps. And so it looks as though this thing is uh, actually a real thing. And so here I am today. brothers, sisters? And I, yes, I have brothers, sisters, and three children, and I've chased them all and said, go get tested. What are you crazy? What are you waiting for? And so uh, I will continue to chase them because none of them, to my knowledge, has been tested. None of my children have, so I will keep after Thank them. Thank you very much. Just in case. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, I take a chance. 
Hi, uh, I'm Tom Dyer. I'm 62 years old. Um, so how I came to the study is I had heart surgery. I had uh, a valve replacement in 2014 and a quad bypass. And while I, I guess while I was there, I might have been under the influence, I signed up for the bio. <laughs> uh, I don't really remember doing that, but I would have done it anyway. Uh, and but uh, so in a couple of months ago, I was in Ireland. I was traveling. I was on vacation with my partner, and I got a phone call saying that they, some evidence come up uh, uh, for in the genetic testing, and which was wow. Okay, I didn't even remember that I had genetic testing. So it was interesting, and uh, so I came. Uh, in, you know, we followed up, and I came in, and we talked about. Uh, uh, the, uh, it was the GLA gene is, the GLA gene uh, has a variant that uh, will cause something, uh, I think it's a rare disease called Fabry disease, and it's a problem with uh, lysomal, it's a lysomal disease. And uh, Dr. Green uh, uh, clued me in on what, what it was in that there's actually a, uh, there's a treatment, there's a new treatment called Garifold for it that came out in 2000, that was FDA approved in 2018. But uh, so uh, it was kind of overwhelming, you know, to get all this information. And at the time we had cameras on us as well, so it was, it was a little distracting. But uh, so I promptly went home and looked it up uh, and got freaked out uh, by the fact that a lot of people don't live to be past 50. Depending on where you look, I mean, the internet is, can say anything, right? And so uh, uh, I got a little freaked out about that, a little bit, and um, quickly um, called my son, who is here and who knows a lot about this uh, kind of thing. And uh, he's worked at the NAH and here at the Broad. And he looked it up and helped me out and you know, determined that it was a, it was a, a probably a non-classic variant because I'm 62, and most of the most of the uh, you know the effects come out in childhood and adolescence. So that was that was relieving. So that was good. Good. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And our our last is a baby seek uh, yeah. individual. Sure. Okay. What's your name? You're not going to speak. We practiced. What's your name? Can you say it? Cora. Good job. And what do you take every night after dinner? Medicine. And why do you take it? Because my body is not like anybody else. Uh huh. And what does the medicine do? Healthy. <laughs> Good job. Hi, I'm Lauren Stetson. This is Cora. This is our son Cody hiding in the chair. Um, we're a part of the Baby Seek Project. Cora was born three years ago, and I was approached in our hospital room less than 24 hours after giving birth. I was not willing to hear anything unless it was some sort of miracle drug that made childbirth easier. Um, but my husband listened, and we signed Cora up for the Baby Seek Project. Um, and in the mass newborn screening, they test for something called biotinidase deficiency. And when we went home, the doctor called and said that Cora was flagged for biotinidase, but we didn't have a history of it. Just come in, we'll get it retested, we'll see what's going on. Uh, so we took her back, she did blood work again, and she came back as fine. And then about a month later, we got a call from BBC that Cora had been in the group that was tested and that she had a partial biotinidase deficiency. Um, so we were very, very grateful because it was something that had been missed and is easily fixed. She takes medicine every night after dinner um, in a yogurt and that brings her biotin levels back up and it was as easy as that. But it, we wouldn't have caught it if we hadn't been part of this testing. So I, you know, we, like to come and speak about these things because the system that is in place now works, but she fell through the cracks and this picked it up. So it's definitely something that we're very grateful for and she's doing great. So, very nice. Great, all right, so um, this is fantastic. Thank you for those remarks. I think they have been prepped to answer any questions you like. You don't have to be 
uh, overly sensitive about asking them. I've, I've talked to them a lot about their feelings, about insurance, about privacy, about anything, their families, anything you want to ask about, uh, please go ahead and, and feel free to ask. Questions from the audience? I'll, I'll get you started. Um, oh, sorry, there's one. Here's a, oh my goodness. Okay, uh, so my question has to do with the telling your children and family and having them not take any action. And so that's, I mean, that partly relates to Dr. Green's research. Is this just denial? Is it, I'm going to do it tomorrow? Is it, oh, just my dad mouthing off? I mean, how, do, how do we understand this very immediate and direct communication that doesn't produce a response that one would expect. So you're asking um, Joe, Brian, and Ruth why their children or brothers and sisters haven't rushed out to get or the test. Or gone out. Or gone out to get out, the test. Done it. Hi, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I have, uh, I have a large family. I have uh, four brothers, uh, three brothers and four sisters, and I've notified all of them, and they've pretty much blown me off. Uh, they, I don't know. I don't know why they haven't reacted, uh, you know, to uh, getting tested. Uh, and my daughter, who would, this is my, my particular case, uh, it's X-linked. Uh, the gene is X-linked, so it would be my daughter would be the most at risk for Fabre. And uh, she's just a really busy person. And so I think uh, she does want to get it done, but... Uh, when she has some time, yeah, yeah. Was that did that answer your question? Yeah, or, yeah. There's no real answer. Yeah, yeah. It was. It did. It it seemed a lot more significant to me when I heard it than yeah. to them. Yeah. yeah. So I can say that there is a complication for the FAP attenuated FAP gene that has made it challenging for my kids. Um, in that, if that shows up. Uh, nobody is allowed to see that because it's HIPAA protected, except insurance companies. And then you can be denied short-term, long-term disability and other types of insurance if you have the FAP gene. So if they go and they get tested and it shows up and it's in their medical record, then they, um, and they're very young, right? So that means right. for the rest of the life, maybe they can't. So it's been challenging that way. And they're also kids. They're going to live forever, right? So this raises just two points I'd like to comment on. One, whereas testing the general population for rare diseases, there is a low prior probability of finding the condition. When you test family members through so-called cascade testing, there is a very high probability, 50% for first-degree family members, and in the case of his daughter, an obligate carrier. So even in clinical genetics, as I, when I trained in it just a few years ago as a, as a kind of an older trainee, I was stunned at the state of the sort of casual state with which we do ca cascade testing. I mean, this is the most obvious place where you could actually intervene and save lives because you already know the mutation is running in the family. The other thing is that when, um, with tremendous effort, Gina was passed in 2008, the compromise was that long term. Uh, was that life insurance, uh, long-term care insurance, and uh, disability insurance were not covered. Uh, but this is having still profound, and I, I think now um, severe, life-threatening effects on the ability to potentially find things and save people in this high in this high risk uh, population of relatives. Because as you can hear this, and as we hear over and over again, this stops people cold from wanting to get tested. O other questions, please. Do I yeah. just Dr. talk to this? <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me let me toss him. What's your understanding and expectation for the future applicability of, of the data in the, in the sense that your child's been sequenced now. That sequence is sitting there, and knowledge is changing all the time. So something may show up in the future that has implications. Uh, is your understanding that that's a permanent resource relative to your child that will be looked at over and over again? Yeah, she definitely, there were a few other things that were flagged, um, but were not from 
my husband and I both, so potentially are not issues, but could be issues, and they explain them, and like, chances were one in 800,000. I mean, it was really rare things that they had no study on, which I thought was so interesting, because if we keep doing this, there's probably way more people that have it, we just don't know. Um, and also, Dr. Green can verify this, but she was only tested for things that are childhood illnesses, um, and then later we were contacted about uh, a small number. Of yeah, the breast cancer gene, things like that, um, things that were highly actionable, and we, my husband and I, and Cora did that as well and came back fine. But so everything was childhood related. So, so it raises the issue, and I'd like Robert's comment on. It. Essentially, you've now created a new communication level which is the communication between the parent and the child with respect to the information that affects them later. Yes. And how do you anticipate either studying or dealing with that? Great, great question. Um, part of what prompted us, I, I of course, of my usual um, whatever, wanted to test BabySeq for everything. Uh, we compromised with the IRB and only tested for conditions that could conceivably come in childhood or young adulthood, adolescence. Uh, but then we went back because we found a BRCA mutation in one of the children. We had saliva samples from the mother, and we could not, by protocol, tell them. So we went through an elaborate six-month thing with the IRB, two IRBs, and the FDA in order to allow uh, just the ACMG59 to be looked for in the babies. And that's, that's what she was referring to. We and then had to reconsent all the families to ask if they wanted us to look. And fortunately, that family, without ever being told we'd found something, said, sure, you can tell me about adult things. And then we were able to tell the mother, and she had no idea she was a carrier. So this, this is the kind of stuff that, that, that you get into. But uh, Jim's question also, I think, raises the notion that the individual is not so much the patient, it's the family that's the patient. It's not the way we think and it's not the way we bill, it's not the way we protect privacy, it's not the way we do anything in our healthcare system. But I think we're gonna have to embrace that variation on our concepts as, as this information becomes, becomes more. Jim, uh, let me just, I, I took it away from, um, yeah, from you over here. Yeah, so my, my question is for the gentleman with the Fabry, the gene associated with Fabry. For Joe. And you described a moment where you found out you had this gene and then you, you know, found this scary information about people usually having a serious consequence by the time they're 50 and that wasn't happening in your case. And then learning more from other sources and uh, I think your son. Mm. I'm curious in your own words or in the words of people that helped clarify things, whether they're explanations that uh, you found helpful in, in reconciling, okay, it, it wasn't deterministic, it wasn't, it didn't just automatically happen. How do you reconcile this? You have this gene, but you don't have the, the symptoms, what's? Happening? Yeah, well, I mean, it became really clear really, really quickly that, uh, you know, went to the Fabre Disease Foundation, uh, there's like a number of them, and uh, they told, and it indicated that uh, the symptoms happen in early childhood, adolescence, I'm 62 those haven't happened. So that was uh, pretty much uh, a relief. Uh, I guess it's classic and non-classic Fabrace, and Fabry, uh the symptoms uh, follow classic. And, you know, and those show up relatively early. Even people that don't uh, catch it in adolescence or childhood, uh, it catches up to them basically in middle age and in their 40s. I'm in my 60s. So I pretty much assumed that I had non-classic uh, February, so that was that was a relief. That did that answer your question? Or? And, and then in the non-classic, was there since it's not an automatic deterministic effect, whether there was language or a way of thinking about the relationship that helped you understand? Well, he already has cardiomyopathy, so he has a disease which may be attributable to the February. Jim? Good question for Robert. In this project and in your preventive genomics clinic, how are you handling the issue of periodic reannotation and recontact? The question is uh, periodic reanalysis, recontact. Um, we, in some ways, we are not handling it. There is no billing mechanism. There is no protocol. 
Um, Heidi, before she left LMM, and, and Matt, now that he's directing it, have put into place a reanalysis, uh, well, a, a reclassification paradigm such that when the database changes, there is an alert that goes out to partners' physicians. Uh, they, they may have data on how many times those, those alerts are read, opened, acted upon. Um, so there's, there's certainly attempts to do that, but across the country, there's no systematic consensus that this needs to be done. I guess, there, Heidi, there was, a, there was a paper recently, right, that maybe you could comment on that. There was a paper recently that addressed this from the, was it the ACMG or the or AMP? Yeah, so ACMG has come out with some guidance around uh, reanalysis, recontact. And, you know, the, the gist of it is it's the responsibility of all parties have to do this in some way, shape, or form. The lab needs to try to update. The physician needs to reach out and recheck. And the patient themselves, as they move around healthcare systems, need to take some ownership. So, you know, there is some onus on all parties. I think the main point is awareness that knowledge and evidence and variance change, and you have to keep on top of it. You want to pass it back to people? Fabulous uh, morning, and thanks to the patients for coming in, because it adds a reality to it. And one of the, it's been beautifully presented, but one of the issues which you haven't d developed yet, and it's, I would like to know how you're handling this, is there sort of a heavy note of sort of genetic determinism to the day? In other words, you have a gene, you have a disease. Penetrance is a real issue for a lot of dominant conditions and certainly for polygenic risk scores. How do you handle the issue of penetrance? Because mm -hmm. it relates very much to family testing. You know, I may have the disease, I may have the gene, but I don't have the disease. Should I be worrying about that? And it plays such a big role in the link between genotype and phenotype here. Um, and it's an area of ambiguity. Uh, so how, how do you address it and how do the patients feel about it? So um, thank you so much because it's so important. And I, it's important at every level in the sense that I think we geneticists and as a community need to change our language. I still hear people talking about when you test healthy individuals, you find a finding, you're making a diagnosis. In no sense is that a diagnosis. That is the language when you have a affected child in front of you, you're searching for a molecular answer and you have made a molecular diagnosis. We need to change the language and say, we've now identified a DNA risk factor. And if you put it in that language and you truly frame it that way, I believe it's not that different from so many things we do in medicine, like cholesterol, like high blood pressure, where people, doctors and patients, intuitively develop language to discuss probabilistic. Now, nobody is good at probabilities, of course. We're terrible at it. Um, doctors are the worst. But uh, you can sit with a patient and say, look, your cholesterol is elevated. This puts you at increased risk for heart disease and stroke. And so we can talk to Brian and say, you aren't necessarily going to get colon cancer. I'm not telling you you're going to get it. But you have a condition that puts you at increased risk over your lifetime. Let's, let's take steps like frequent colonoscopies. And they get that. And that's part and parcel of the day-to-day -day practice of medicine. The other thing is that I think more and more geneticists all know this, but more and more we're finding that the classic forms, particularly of the monogenic diseases, is only the tip of the iceberg, and we're finding partial syndromes. They may or may not be life-threatening, but we're finding either biochemical abnormalities or partial clinical features. So we don't know for sure that with a 40% biotin level that, 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 that this baby has, this baby's going to get the rash, the developmental delay, the seizures. I mean, it's a horrible disease when you have zero enzyme. It's, we all have 100. She has 40%. I can't tell you with absolute certainty that this baby would have been impaired. But on the other hand, if this baby had 10 IQ points or 20 IQ points less when she got to college, who would know? That would have been completely invisible to all of us. So um, it's, it's, this N of one stuff is really tricky because we're not going to get 20 or 50 or 100 patients with 40% biotinidase level, put them in a randomized trial. We're going to have to do some things on best estimate, faith, and good medical judgment.
screening community for all those kids that showed up as positive that upon retest weren't positive. Yes. Should be treated. It, or at least should be re should, should have an enzyme a quantitative enzyme level which they don't get now. Yeah, exactly. Who's next? So my, my question is open to any of you all. It's about informed consent. I think uh, many of you, uh, you know, did informed consent in the context of uh, a, a biobank or registry when you were not necessarily uh, sick or had a symptom. And I'm just wondering if um, what ultimately happened with you all in terms of getting the call from the biobank and the subsequent workups, did, it, did you feel like uh, you understood that that was what was going to happen? Is it, were the expectations from the informed consent matched the actuality of what ended up occurring? Um, so for me, um, the workflow that Dr. Green had showed earlier, where, you know, after all the testing and the meetings, there is a final step of entering the condition, right, or, or whatever is into the electronic health record. So this, this did happen on mine. So now um, when I go in, I see I have a BRCA1 mutation. Um, but I was fully aware of that. I consented to that. My stance was I'd rather know than not know and deal with it. Um, and in fact, actually, at the breast um, mammogram clinic uh, where I go to locally, they have a standard survey now that you have to fill out when you come in. Um, it's on iPads, whether you were BRCA1 tested or you know that you have the mutation. And that's new. This wasn't there two years ago, but it is now. And so the radiologist, I had a mammogram done um, last fall. She's now, it's, she's dealing with it in a very responsive, positive way. So uh, I see no issues. And Joe, you had forgotten you had even signed yeah. up for the biobank, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. in what sense yeah. could, were you consented to receive the genetic results? Was that, was that did you feel, did you ever feel like you didn't, ha hadn't given consent? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, I would have signed up for this. It's just in my nature to do that. I mean, I was uh, pretty much, uh, you know, I had been looking into my family history, and I had, you know, I want to know a lot about myself. And uh, so I think it was just in my nature to do that. But I was under some serious influence of opioids, I think, maybe <laughs> when, I, when they came to me, you know, after having the, uh, but, but I don't, it could have been that. I don't remember. Yeah. That it could be, it was just so long ago. Yeah, I just yeah. don't remember. You know, you're, when you're in the hospital, there's a lot of, well, a lot well, of stuff and, going and this on. Is, this is part of the question about consent. If we, if we consent you, as we did in BabySeek, with a framing that tells you all about the negatives in great detail, you are likely to say no. And I just want to also point out that we didn't cherry pick these patients. Uh, there are patients, of course, who have been upset by their findings. There are patients who've been traumatized by their findings. There are patients who wish, few patients who wish they'd never gotten it. We haven't encountered any of them ourselves, uh, but these were very characteristic of the people that we've returned to thus far. Emily? Uh, Robert, uh, first, thanks so much for the patients uh, for coming here. It's just a wonderful treat for us. And I do want to give Robert the closing words. And you mentioned um, this um, this skepticism about genomic, genomic medicine and maybe a missed opportunity where the IRBs went from pessimistic to overly enthusiastic. But I want to get your insight about um, what would be your dream study that could be designed, say, in five years, where you actually use genetics to prove an, incre uh, an improvement in outcomes. And how might you design that for, say, a five-year time frame? Yeah, I, I've actually pitched uh, a large scale uh, of uh, MedSeq and BabySeq to NIH and to some large private foundations and to some large donors. And um, it hasn't yet been funded, but I think the, the idea would be a, a large-scale study that was truly a randomized trial. And you could do a stop-start, you know, you could do a, a, a group that uh, was randomized at the same time and then was disclosed maybe a year or two later so that everybody actually did get disclosure. But I do think we, if we're ever going to get the, the United States Task Force on Preventive Medicine and other learned bodies to agree that this is important and get insurance companies to pay for it, we're going to need to show them the evidence at the level that they expect for everything else. And that is, in general, randomized trial. Now, when you aggregate rare things together, it makes for a messy trial. But it's not impossible to do, Jim. But don't your studies also already indicate that uh, there's a 
there's information in the healthcare system that if it was just analyzed and captured properly, you could avoid even having to do this for many people uh, because you, they'd be directly sent to an education counselor. Uh, Jim asked for those over there, if, if there isn't information either in the family history or in the electronic health record that you could already know you should test people, yes and no. There's definitely some people who, if we did that, we would find them and test them. But there was about 28% of the people, for example, with the cancer predisposition mutations who did not meet N NCCN criteria either upon initial chart review or upon requirements. So I guess it's a matter of degree. I guess I'm wondering whether you yeah, yeah, you could. Or you could just, and this will be my parting word, or you could just imagine a day when thoughtful, comprehensive DNA analysis, just like clinical symptomatology, family history, and physical exam, is a fourth pillar for the practice of medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the patience.